Good morning, Thank everyone. You. And welcome. Um, many thanks to everyone for being here with us today. Um, my name is Ray Arrell. Um, I'm head of, head of Technical Development at Regen. Um, and I'll be your guide, your pilot today for um, today's session as we navigate the wonderful world of distribution future energy scenarios um, for the north of Scotland. Um, so Regen has been working with um, Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks for a few years now, um, helping them to understand the future uh, and the energy transition and how that might impact um, their electricity distribution networks in both the Southern Central England license area and the North of Scotland, uh, which is what we'll be um, talking about today. Um, as people join and people uh, jump into the session, many thanks for being here and welcome. Uh, please do um, introduce yourselves on the chat function. Um, and uh, we, we will be using Zoom um, to present uh, the slides um, and any questions that you have for us, we'll have a chance towards the end of, towards the, end of the session. Um, please do put them into the Q&A function um, within, within Zoom itself. We will also be um, asking you guys some questions and we'll be using Mentimeter um, for that. And I'll explain a bit more about how that's gonna work in a little while, but essentially chat and questions sent our way, please use the, uh, the Zoom functions uh, for, for that. So um, in a little while, you'll be uh, hearing from some of my colleagues. So I'm joined today by uh, Joel Venn, uh, Head Analyst at Regen, and Tamsin Lonsdell-Smith, uh, Energy Analyst at Regen. And we'll also be joined by Steve Atkins, who you'll hear from in a moment, who is the DSO Transition Manager at SSEN. And around half past, uh, we will be moving um, after an introduction from Steve to give some background around the DFES and, and where it, uh, how it features in SSEN's uh, longer term planning, um, we'll be getting into some individual technology sessions. So we want to ask you um, for some views and input and insights around a number of the technologies that are in scope um, for us in terms of understanding the future and understanding the energy transition in the north of Scotland. So. We'll be about an hour um, across a number of different technologies. And then around half past 11, uh, there's a chance for a bit of a Q&A session with myself, uh, the team uh, delivering the analysis and also with SSEM as well. Um, so for those who don't know Regen, um, a bit about us, uh, we're a not-for-profit center of energy expertise based in Exeter in Devon. And we've been working with a number of the uh, energy networks on uh, DFES, as we call it, Distribution of Future Energy Scenarios Analysis, uh, for many years, since, since around 2015. Um, and yeah, we're really excited and interested to be involved in, in this year's analysis. Uh, with a number of things happening and changing and transitioning in the energy sector, it's really good to be in the thick of the understanding the future. So as I mentioned, we are using Menti today. Um, so for some of the parts of the session when we're asking some in, uh, questions about and insights about some of the technologies that we are assessing, um, we would like to use a platform that essentially gathers some polls, some statistics and some answers from everybody. So what I'd like everyone to do, if that's okay, please could you take out your smartphones um, and keep Zoom on screen on your laptop or your computer that you're using. But if you could grab your phone, go to your phone's browser, and put in menti.com, that will essentially take you um, to a page that will allow you to put in the event code. So the event code um, for today's session is 75978817. So if you put in that code, that will take you to essentially a sort of parallel set of questions that will appear and update automatically on your phone. Um, and then you can submit your answers and your views um, as, as we go through the session. So what I'd like to do is a quick test question. Um, so everyone grab their phone, put in that code, that six di uh, eight digit code, sorry. And let's see if we can get some, uh, some, some voting underway. So great to see we've got some, some uh, outcomes here that are probably inevitable, um, that dinosaurs are indeed the coolest. Uh, but yes, please do um, put in that code. It's 
8817. Um, don't worry if you're still finding your phone or you're, or you're getting, getting to put your browser in. We're going to have some presentations, um, so it gives you a chance to, to get your phone ready to dial in to the, uh, the other important questions, because this one is obviously very important as well. Uh, but that's great. So we've got some um, results coming in there. Um, many thanks. Um, and we will um, move on. So without further ado, I think I'll hand now to Steve Atkins, who is the DSO Transition Manager at SSEN, um, who's going to get a, give a bit of an introduction and context um, as to where the DFES fits in uh, within SSEN's wider work. Um, over to you, Steve. Thanks, Ray. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, really good to ha have such great attendance uh, on this session. Uh, good to see a cross section as well of local authorities, community groups, and uh, commercial entities. So uh, that's uh, that's really useful for for us, and uh, uh, means we get you know, good good strong um, feedback from a cross section of our stakeholders. Um, I'm just going to spend a minute, just uh, an introduction to uh, SSEN, just to uh, clarify our position as the, the network's business uh, and then roll on to how we use the the distribution future energy scenarios so if we can go to the next slide um so uh, sse has seven uh, business units uh, you can see them there uh, we've got um, uh, thermal investment uh, renewables enterprise and energy customer solutions uh, sseN uh, SSE Networks is the transmission distribution business, and uh, uh, we're speaking to you as the, the distribution business uh, today. Uh, we don't have a supplier arm. Uh, some of you probably know we uh, uh, divested uh, ourselves of that a couple of years ago. Um, on the next slide, uh, uh, to show license areas we have two pretty diverse uh, uh, license areas uh, in terms of uh, the highlands and islands of, uh, of, of scotland and uh, central southern england um, uh, with its uh, with its total island, island token island in the isle of wight down there um, so a pretty pretty diverse uh, business covering 3.8 million uh, homes uh, and business um, and obviously you know interesting topology in terms of uh, subsea cables and island communities uh, in particular. Um, just moving on to uh, to the next slide. Um, clearly, uh, net zero is going to fundamentally uh, reshape uh, electricity demand, uh, and then you can see, you know, from from this uh, the, these figures from the committee on uh, on climate change. You know, some of the areas that are going to impact on our network in uh, out to uh, 2050 in terms of transport, heat, industry and agriculture, hydrogen, electrolysis, synthetic fuels, carbon capture and storage. Um, and the, the over, overall headline is that electricity demand could uh, increase by uh, two or three times by, by 2050. So we need to understand how that uh, uh, increasing demand is going to affect our network and particular in the in the localities as well because that that impact isn't an even spread if you go to uh, the next slide uh, some of the some of the work that we're doing is to really help local communities understand uh, exactly what the impact is in their their area and working with them uh, particularly with local authorities and local enterprise partnerships uh, and local authority bodies to to understand the impact in their area. So uh, some of the headlines here, John O'Groat's uh, journal and Caithness Courier, um, rapid growth in electric vehicles in the, in the highlands. Um, as uh, you can see, you know, there's a huge, huge impact across the board. If we turn to the next slide, and, and this is where the distribution, distribution future energy scenarios come in. We've been utilising Regen since uh, 2018 um, to, uh, to build these future energy scenarios, uh, which use the, the national uh, future energy scenarios uh, and um, uh, adjust them to reflect um, both uh, policy targets uh, and national targets. So, for example, uh, we've worked closely with the Scottish Government 
um, and then adjusting to a, to a lower level as well. So as we build the regional um, distribution future energy scenarios, we build those into our network constraint and heat mapping, uh, and we formulate our network investment plans on the back of those. And as you can see underneath there, at each point, we want to engage with stakeholders to build that evidence base and to uh, understand the impact. As we as we move into our next price control period, where Ofgem are allowing for for more strategic development, then it's important that we're able to to justify to Ofgem where that strategic development could take place. Um, and your feedback and and evidence is um, a key part of that. We need to build those into. Uh, to these scenarios, because uh, as it says, bottom right there, there's no one size uh, fits all approach to securing uh, the transition to net zero. Uh, on the next uh, slide, um, what I thought I'd do is just give you an illustration of um, uh, the impact of uh, the transition to net zero on, on our network, just to, just to illustrate the point. Now, the, the, the area that I've picked here is, uh, isn't picked at random. Uh, this is Quasi Kwarteng's uh, um, area, you know, his uh, constituency in Spelton in the south. Uh, and it just goes to show, you know, the impact on the network. And we use these slides with him uh, to show uh, how it will affect the network. So here we've got uh, heat pump projections under two of the scenarios, leading the way, which is the leading one, uh, and steady progression, which is a, a, a more conservative one, doesn't actually uh, get us to, uh, to to net zero, but leading lead the way uh, clearly does. Um, so uh, this one is for heat pumps, um, but you can see the uplift in, in both of them. If we move to the next slide, this is domestic uh, electric vehicle EV uptakes, and you can see even between the two, there's not a huge amount. Although although the uptake is quick, the out the outturn is 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 pretty similar. And if you combine those on the uh, the next slide, uh, in terms of impact on our uh, networks, so first looking at steady progression, uh, you can see the substations here turning from green. Uh, to yellow to red to show that they're uh, overloaded uh, th throughout the year. So as you go out to 2040 uh, and then on to 2050, uh, you know, a significant impact, even, even at the steady progression scenario. Flip to the next slide, under leading the way, you can see that the, the impact on our substations in that Spelthorn area uh, is, is far more significant. Even by 2030, there's you know, significant uh, shades of red across the uh, uh, across the area, uh, and out to uh, 20, 2050, the, the majority uh, of the network is uh, is overloaded. Um, so you can see uh, this um, going up to the network level. Um, what that means for our LV networks out to uh, 2050. Uh, so under steady progression, 106 of our uh, LV networks overloaded uh, at, on leading the way, 193 of our uh, LV networks uh, overloaded. Now I don't say this to, you know, to say uh, we can't cope. This is to, to be clear that we understand the problem. We can see what, what's coming. And that's what DFES gives us is that view of the future. Uh, so we can see this and we can then um, put in plans to to mitigate the uh, this, uh, both in terms of reinforcement build, uh, but also in terms of the utilisation of flexibility as um, low carbon growth of low carbon technology uh, gives us more and more flexible ways to uh, affect uh, the flows of electricity uh, and to uh, mitigate the, uh, the worst of uh, peak demand. Um, on this, uh, on the final slide here. Um, so this is just, uh, as I said, the DFES forms a core part of our uh, ED2 plan, um, and you know the, the kind of three areas that we're that we're working there uh, within the DFES is to be a valued and trusted service for our communities, uh, customers, and communities, maintaining a safe, resilient, and responsive network, but ensuring that we. Uh, are able to progress towards a net zero world and achieve those uh, um, the targets that we have. So 2050 in the South uh, and 2045 in, in Scotland. 
Um, so that's our focus and the, and the DFES gives us a, a brilliant insight into that uh, so that we can have a positive impact on society and accommodate uh, that, uh, that change. Um, and you know, make sure that uh, we can use stakeholder input as as a key evidence base for uh, adjusting our plans accordingly uh, to make sure that we can uh, move to that net zero world. Uh, unfortunately, I'm uh, unable to stay stay with you for the rest of the session. Uh, but you and Norrington, uh, who's our key. Um, commercial uh, accounts manager in the, in the north uh, is going to be uh, uh, joining the call um, and Ray and you will be able to answer questions as, uh, as we go forward so thanks for your time and I'll hand back to uh, Ray. Many thanks Steve, um, thanks very much for that overview uh, yeah, and as Steve said uh, we'll be joined by uh, Ewan Norrington from SSE who's the lead account manager in the connections team, um, who will be joining the panel. Uh, so please do um, any questions you have for SSCN as we go through the session and the technologies, uh, we'll be seeing those in the Q&A within Zoom. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put those through. And any we don't answer today, we'll be taking away and uh, happily uh, responding offline um, after the event. So I'm gonna give a quick um, summary of uh, DFES, the whys and wherefores. Um, some of the of you guys may have seen uh, a pre-read document that we sent out ahead of the session, which gives a bit of a an overview of what DFES is all about. So I'm not planning to go th through that in detail, uh, but just some key aspects really. So we're planning to summarise what the DFES is. Then we're going to get into some technologies and then give you guys a chance to ask us some questions at the end. So as Steve mentioned, it's DFES is part of a wider process. So we do future scanning scenario forecasting for a number of technologies that feeds into network planning using profiles and demand uh, management and planning and, and assessment that goes through into investment decision making long term investment planning and ultimately that feeds into the business planning for the for the Rio period um, that the networks are undertaking. The scenario framework that we use, as we said, is National Grid ESO's FES or Future Energy Scenarios. Um, won't go through this in great detail, but essentially they are four worlds for economic, societal, technological places to be uh, by between now and 2050 across all of the electricity and uh, other energy um, demand and generation sources. The scenarios are built around two axes, one around speed of decarbonisation and the other around level of societal change. Um, so we have steady progression at the bottom that Steve touched on earlier. Um, and then we have leading the way essentially in the top right of those two axes, fastest credible decarbonization, significant lifestyle change, et cetera. And then we have two other uh, views. So the three scenarios in green, yellow, and blue there are compliant with net zero 2050. We're also acknowledging and seeing how um, Scot Scottish decarbonisation for 2045 targets can be applied specifically and the milestone targets liaising with Scottish Government um, and we're looking at one scenario potentially consumer transformation as a sort of focus area around how we can adopt and apply Scotland specific objectives and outcomes. Um, so what we, we use these scenarios to define um, broad assumptions and the worlds that they are but what we do not do is essentially take the national grid data that comes with the FES and then divide it down into the license areas. We build our own bottom-up evidence-led project development-led um, scenarios between now and 2050 for each technology and then we reconcile and compare and contrast to the FES regional data um, where available um, as, as a process towards the end. The technologies that we cover essentially anything that interacts or directly connects to the distribution electricity network in the license area so all the renewable technologies um, the waste driven technologies fossil fuel generation uh, electricity storage variants and also disruptive future technologies such as hydrogen electrolyzers which could be a significant source of electricity demand for example for the distribution network we also look at um, low carbon technologies or smaller scale domestic technologies um, that interact with the, with the network at lower voltages. So electric vehicles of, of a number of different types, electric vehicle chargers, 
of a number of different archetypes, whether it's on street, off street, depot, supermarket, car parks, for example. We also look at heating technologies that are electrically fueled. So heat pumps of, of, of different types and scales, direct electric heating, and we also consider hybrid heating systems as well. Um, and we also look at domestic rooftop PV. Alongside the sort of connected technologies, we also have uh, an, an online uh, data exchange with all 66 of the local authorities that are within the two license areas. Um, and we basically have a, a, an exchange around uh, potential for new housing builds, and domestic developments, and also non-domestic developments that the, uh, the local authorities have sight of. So we basically take that data and we have that as a separate projection that we do out to 2050 as well. So many thanks to any local authorities that are on the call with us today uh, for the information and the data that we have, uh, have been given uh, so far for this year's study. For each of those technologies or, or elements, we essentially follow a four-stage process where we look at historic baseline, what's been built and connected to date. We look at the near-term pipeline of known projects uh, that either have accepted connection offers with SSCN themselves, that have planning application activity, or are active in things such as the UK capacity market, and then we build a near-term pipeline based on the scenario that you are, we are in. And then beyond that, out to 2050, we develop projections. And that's essentially when the scenario comes into play beyond known projects and beyond developments out to 2050. What we then do, so once we have a total, for example, this could be a projection for onshore wind, for example. It's not, it's just an example. Um, but you know, this kind of uh, projection for the license area, we then disaggregate those. Um, or, or split them up essentially into to say where within the license area do we think that capacity and the, those projects will connect. And we do this through something called electricity supply areas. So we essentially divide up the license area around SSEN's infrastructure. Um, we basically create small supply areas at two different voltage levels. So we're at 11,000 volts, so the bigger generation and storage projects that's where we distribute, where we think they will be connecting. Um, but for the smaller sort of domestic scale technologies or the low carbon technologies, as we call them, um, we do that down to another layer. So low voltage feeder and substation level, which pretty much ends up being uh, street level projections for, for you know, onshore, uh, sorry, um, on street parking, uh, EV charges and, uh, and heat pumps, for example. So that's a bit of a summary of, um, of what the DFES process is all about. Um, today, we're not going to cover every single one of those technologies because we'd need a lot longer uh, to be able to, to ask you about those variants. But we would like to, to talk to you about some of the key ones. So uh, between myself, um, Joel and Tamsin, we would like to talk about transport, around heat, renewable energy technologies within the license area, storage, uh, fossil fuels, and hydrogen electrolysis as well. So before we um, move on to the polling, so please do um, grab your phones, uh, have them at the ready as we get into some of the, uh, of the polls. Um, menti.com on your browser, on your phone, and put in that eight digit code 75978817. And then hopefully um, you'll have a form where we'd love to know a little bit more about you, your, where you're coming from, the organization that you're, you're representing today and a particular area that you're um, most interested in um, in terms of the technologies and areas that we've covered there. Um, so we'll give you a, a little bit to, to fill that in before we get into the sessions, but probably at this point it's best to say we welcome all views from everyone. If you're not an expert in hydrogen electrolyzers, which probably not many people are just yet, or, or you're not involved in EV deployment, you're more interested in, in the bigger technologies like wind and solar, that's absolutely fine. We really value any input, any thoughts from your experience and your work in the energy sector, um, any and all engagement that we have and evidence that we have to put into our modeling for this year, um, we, are, we, we very much value and we very much welcome. So um, yeah, please don't be afraid to dive in as we get into some of the technologies, even if it's a gut feel, um, or, or a view you have on the fly, you know, that's absolutely fine. So we've got about 23 people have, have dived in on those forms. I think there's around uh, 50 of us on the call. So we'll give that another 10 seconds. 
and then we'll probably dive in um, and get underway with some of the technology polls and views. So I can see also there's some questions coming in. Um, many thanks for those guys. We will definitely um, uh, take take some time to, to have a good Q&A session towards the end. Um, anyone who wants to uh, upvote any questions that they'd like us to prioritize, please do uh, jump onto the Q&A and you can give it the thumbs up um, and we will see those float to the top. Um, and if we have too many to answer today, as I said, there's a, 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 another chance to, to get a view on that as we respond with a Q&A document that will be coming out after the event. So we're on 30 responses. I think um, we'll probably um, get into some of the questions there. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Joel Venn, who's the head analyst um, at Regen and a bit of a DFES veteran. Um, so he'll be taking you through uh, transport and heat. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys in a little while. Over to you, Joel. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be focusing uh, uh, a few slides and a few questions on uh, the uptake of EVs uh, and the uptake of EV charges. Uh, while we might have a more holistic view on transport as a whole, we're focusing in on the technologies that might be the most disruptive to the distribution network. Uh, and of course, before thinking about where we might be in 2050, um, it would be good to, good place to start is, is where we are now. Um, so got a few statistics here on the uh, existing um, uptake of uh, EVs and EV chargers um, with a GB average for comparison um, and also both of SSCN's license areas um, in terms of how their uptake is going as uh, they sit to a degree at different ends of the spectrum which tells an uh, interesting story. Um, for SSCN's Scottish license area um, the uptake of EVs has so far been uh, slightly below the national average. Um, and actually it used to be further behind the national average uh, when we we're doing uh, this session last year. Um, so the license area is starting to catch up to the national average uptake rate of EVs. And by uptake rate, what I mean is the, the number of EVs per person or per household within the license area. Uh, in terms of the uptake of EV charges in SSCN Scottish license area, um, it's, it's well above the national average, nearly three times higher than the national uptake rate. Uh, and the result of those two factors is the availability of charges in the license area is dramatically higher than, than the national average. Um, and for comparison, you can see the southern license area there tells the opposite story on on those key factors. Um, so while the uptake of EVs in the license area might be below the national average uh, at the moment, um, uh, we'd consider that potentially by maybe 2030, when there's a ban on petrol and diesel vehicles, or perhaps a little bit later, depending on uh, how the ban on hybrids takes place, um, we'd consider EVs, the uptake of EVs by then to be relatively ubiquitous. If you can't buy a petrol and diesel vehicle, then hopefully the, the uptake of, of those vehicles could be considered ubiquitous. But in terms of the run out to, to that point when EVs are ubiquitous, it's a key modeling uh, assumption for us is, is how, uh, how quickly um, EVs might, might become ubiquitous. And so the first question we're asking you here is your view on when the Scottish areas, uh, Scot SSE and Scottish license areas uptake of EVs uh, will be about the same as the rest of the UK, or perhaps when will the rest of the UK slow down to SSCN's rate or, or vice versa. But um, yeah, possibly leaning towards when um, when Scottish, uh, Scottish uptake of EVs might, might align with the rest of the UK. So a variety of uh, views coming in here, but, but generally uh, it's coming out as at an average at the moment that the uptake of EVs in the license area will um, uh, align before the 2030 ban. So there's an assumption there then that the uptake rate of EVs will dramatically uh, accelerate over the next, uh, next few years. Um, uh, a few answers are slowing down now. It'd be good to get a few more answers in. Um, I've got 17 answers so far, uh, but it'd be nice to have a few more. If anyone else has any views on, on this, would be uh, 
very much, very much like to hear hear your views. Uh, thank you. Up to twenty two. Uh, we'll just give it a couple more seconds, and we'll go on to the next question. Um, so, thank you for your views on on EVs. Um, now, I've got uh, a slide on EV chargers. Um, so, of course, uh, in thinking about how EV infrastructure might look in the future, it's good to think about what there currently is at the moment. And the slide here looks at the types of locations that EV chargers are currently located. Um, a few different, we've categorized them into a few different types, uh, such as car parks, workplace on street, uh, destination is a key one. We, we classify destination chargers as places where you go not to charge, but where there happen to be chargers, such as supermarkets, uh, pubs, shops, etc. Um, and we have again uh, got the SSCN, Scottish SSCN license area and the Southern license area here for comparison. And the areas that you, you're looking at here represent the number of charges in different locations. And so at the top, um, the top area is uh, are the location, the relative locations uh, of charges in the Northern Scottish license area. You can see that most charges tend to be in car parks. Um, the reason for that is that most charges in Scotland are publicly funded. Uh, and so uh, charges tend to be located on public land, such as in car parks. And there's also been a, a big push for uh, workplace uh, charging in Scotland as well. Um, so the result of that is uh, a particular view on charging infrastructure, um, whereas the uh, a comparison point is the southern license area. Most charges tend to be privately funded and so are on private land and often more dispersed locations, um, such as uh, on street. And you can see that there are uh, far more on street charges in the southern license area than the Scottish. Um, but you can, uh, yeah, you can see those proportional differences. Um, so the next question asks about how that might play out in the future. Before that, um, just a view as to why this is important. Um, is because we're modeling the uptake of, of charges uh, and EVs down to such a relatively fine granularity. Um, we're modeling them down to uh, what we call feeders, which are the individual cables that run down streets. So you can kind of think of what we're projecting here as street level uptake of these technologies. Um, so obviously, uh, if, if we think charges are going to be predominantly located in publicly owned areas versus privately owned areas, then that's going to have a different impact on the network geographically. Um, so the, just for interest, the graph, the image on the left here is Dundee and the relative availability of off street uh, parking and so off street charging availability, darker areas, more off street parking. Uh, white uh, are less off street parking. And so you'd expect that in the areas of the white in the inner city, that there's uh, that there could be more need for public charging in those areas, such as uh, on street. So yeah, so the uh, question here is your view on the future of uh, public charging infrastructure um, in the North Scotland license area. Do you think um, that there will be a continued focus. Um, the, the status quo might continue in the North Scotland area where you'll have uh, most of the charging infrastructure in publicly owned areas uh, such as car parks and more centralised locations. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, do you think that charging will become um, more widely distributed and uh, the North Scotland licence area might go slightly more towards uh, might go more towards the uh, southern Scottish, uh, so southern SSCM license area where there's more on street and private charging. Or do you do you do you think it might end up somewhere in the middle, which we've coined neighbourhood EV charging hubs, uh, a blend of the two, where um, you don't have quite as much, um, uh, quite as many dispersed um, on street charging, uh, more more neighbourhood clusters of EV charging in public spaces. Um, interesting to see so far uh, erring towards the middle of that. Um, so you're thinking that the uh, 
the charges will become a bit more dispersed and of course it, it's um, the reality is nowhere near as black and white as what we're asking here um, but um, but in our modeling we can uh, uh, tend the scenarios towards towards these different views um, great thank you I think we're at a similar number to the previous question um, so I, in just a second I will move on to heat and again while we might have a more holistic view on, on heat, uh, we're focusing in on some of the most uh, disruptive uh, technologies um, uh, that, that might impact the distribution network. Uh, so we're focusing in on predominantly heat pumps, um, also gonna be talking about other technologies as well. And as before, it's good to look at the current situation on the ground to evaluate how things might, might develop uh, in the future. And the, the key point to focus on with domestic heating in North Scotland, when looking at the uh, types of heating technologies and fuels that currently heat homes. Um, uh, the key point here is the number of homes, the proportion of homes that are heated by natural or by fossil gas on the gas network. Um, the GB average uh, for the percentage of homes heated by gas with gas boilers uh, is about 85%. Um, the SSEN uh, Scotland license area is significantly below that at about 57%. So the, uh, the graph on the right um, tells us about the, uh, the distribution, the proportion of homes heated by different technologies ordered uh, in order of the percentage that uh, are heated by gas. And you can see that Aberdeen City is the most on gas, as you might expect. Um, on gas areas tend to be more urban areas, um, but Aberdeen City is less on gas than the GB average to emphasize how uh, off gas the uh, license area is. Um, also, as you might expect, the, the islands um, in the license area are the most off gas, where the vast majority of heating is provided by uh, direct electric and storage heating and oil, LPG uh, and solid fuel heating. So this creates an interesting uh, modeling uh, point for us in thinking about the distribution of future heating technologies, um, in particular heat pumps. Uh, we know that uh, at the moment, uh, there's a correlation between off gas areas and the uptake of heat pumps. Um, heat pumps, uh, it's uh, transferring to a heat pump is more economically viable if you're off the gas grid, if you're not heated by gas. Um, so that's a key modeling factor for us um, as an example of one factor. But there are a lot of other factors as to where heat pumps might be in the future beyond what your existing heating technology is. Um, the Scottish Government has uh, set an aim to install 200,000 heat pumps per year by 2030. But where this might be focused, in particular in the short term, um, is, a, is, a, is a real key question. Um, there are a number of different factors, including those, but there are some others beyond this, but some of the key ones we think are uh, already mentioned, um, how many, whether you're on the on or off the gas grid, but we also think social housing, um, new builds, uh, potentially households in few poverty are potential key drivers for the uptake of, of heat pumps. As this question asks you um, your view on the relative likelihood of, um, of heat, the uptake of heat pumps being concentrated um, towards, towards some of these key factors. Um, 200,000 heat pumps per year by 2030 is of course ambitious and by that point, again, it's, it's not as black and white as just one or the other here. We are looking at a variety. Um, while you answer this question, please excuse me for a second. I'm just going to uh, clear my throat. But yeah, we appreciate, appreciate your views on the uh, relative um, likelihood of heat pumps concentrating in some of these, in some of these areas.
Thank you for that little break to clear my throat. Um, answers are just about at the numbers we've had previously. Um, just a bit a moment longer. Um, uh, and of course, um, so we're talking about these particular use cases. There are um, a number of very uh, you know, um, critical um, situations in which this, this question is somewhat, somewhat different, somewhat more nuanced. And in particular, um, that, that's the case on the Scottish islands. Uh, so the next question is, is on, uh, is a um, similar sort of question focusing in on the Scottish islands uh, in particular. We, we saw that the Scottish islands are, as you might expect, very off gas. Most heating is direct electric uh, and oil and solid fuel. Um, and so if past trends are anything to go by, we might expect a, uh, a high uptake of heat pumps in those areas. Um, but there's a wider question as to um, what the predominant decarbonized heating technology will be, will be for the islands, you know, particularly what's going to replace the oil and solid fuel heating uh, and LPG. Um, so there's, to an extent, there's a couple of questions wrapped up in here. Uh, the first is that is what's going to replace the oil and solid fuel heating. Um, it's going to be it's going to be direct electric. It's going to be heat pumps. Um, uh, it's going to be biomass or hydrogen, and also potentially you know uh, this uh, your your view on the likelihood of direct electric heating being replaced by heat pumps might might get wrapped up into this question. But we're predominantly thinking about what what the what's the heating technology. Um, that's most likely to replace um, oil, uh, LPG, solid fuel, and other fossil fuel uh, fueled heating on the island. Uh, looks like it's a very close thing between electric heat pumps and next generation direct electric. Um, important to differentiate between uh, the uh, 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 not necessarily very popular uh, older uh, storage heating systems with uh, the next generation. Of those technologies, um, that technology has come on leaps and bounds. Um, uh, heat pumps and uh, we've got biomass boilers and uh, low carbon hydrogen boilers lagging quite far behind an electrified uh, heating situation for the islands, which is very interesting to see. Uh, thank you. We are at um, about the same number of. Uh, answers we've had previously. So thank you very much for your answers there. Um, that's me over. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Tamsin now, um, unless Ray is coming in before that. Thank you all. Thanks, Joel. Is uh, Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah, so um, just to say uh, thanks very much for your voting so far. Just wanted to um, quickly um, flash up a reminder about joining Menti. So um, please yeah, grab your phones and menti.com and the codes there, or you can use that QR code if you've got your phone in front of you and you wanted to join, um, because yeah, we've got we've got 50 people on the call and we're getting about 20, 26 to 30 votes uh, coming in per question. We'd love to hear from everyone or as many of you as we possibly can on some of these questions. So uh, any issues you're having with joining that, please do get in touch on the chat. We've got my colleague Hannah who's here as well to, to help you guys out. Um, but yeah, just to say, please do dive in um, and don't worry if you don't know answers and views on every question and every technology, we, we, we really appreciate any inputs and insight at all. So yes, I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Tamsin Lonsdale-Smith, who's an energy analyst here at Regen, and she's gonna be taking you through some renewable energy technologies. Over to you, Tamsin. Great, thank you very much for that introduction, Joel. Um, Ray, excuse me, Joel was just the one speaking before me on the heat and transport technologies and now I'm going to be taking everyone through the larger scale generation technologies. So this is going to include uh, onshore wind, large scale solar PV. I will touch on small scale solar as well, but the focus is going to be on large scale. And I also wanted to touch on hydropower. We had a question on biomass in the chat earlier and as I explained, there are some other technologies that we're not able to cover in this, this session. Um, and we encourage you to take a look at the methodology documentation um, online uh, later on. So jumping straight into onshore wind, here you'll see a GIF of the uh, onshore wind uptake in Great Britain. 
so this is the baseline uptake um, from fairly early on. I think we've got from 2012 until 2020 here. So um, we've got around 3.9 gigawatts of onshore wind of, within the northern license area of SSCN, so that north of Scotland license area. About 1.8 gigawatts of this is transmission connected and 2.1 gigawatts is distribution connected. A further 1.9 gigawatts as well is what we're seeing uh, within the pipeline for this license area in 2001, according to the connections data that we currently have sight of. Here we've got an image of that baseline and pipeline that I was talking about, so you can get a little bit of an idea of that geographic distribution with the baseline here on the left and the pipeline there on the right. And here's a snapshot of some of the wind projections from our 2020 analysis from last year. So onshore wind, as you can see, is a very significant technology for this license area. And we see growth in pretty much all of our scenarios, except for small scale under the steady progression. You see that in that graph uh, on the bottom there and that gray line sort of flatlining. But other than that scenario, we see quite a lot of uptake in all of our scenarios with a bit of variation. Um, so in leading the way, we uh, see large scale capacity reaching, um, actually under the consumer transformation scenario, we see 5.7 gigawatts uh, by 2050 with small scale um, following that by 500 megawatts by 2050. Um, leading the way is actually a little bit lesser in this technology. So we see uh, about 5.1 gigawatts of the large scale um, onshore wind connecting by 2050 and around 370 megawatts of the small scale under this leading the way scenario connecting by 2050. So uh, we were able to make a significant short-term as well as long-term projections thanks to the significant pipeline of projects and a good amount of unconstrained resource according to our in-house uh, wind resource assessment methodology. We also have repowering projections which sees the existing sites as they age taking on these new wind turbine technologies and increasing in connection capacity. And these repowering rates vary depending on the scenario as well, based on the scenario assumptions. So now I'd just like to dive into our first question on this technology. Um, I hope you're ready for this one. We all know that the Scottish license area now makes up a good proportion of the total UK wind. Um, so how do you think this development is going to compare to the rest of the UK up um, to 2050? Do you think that this first option on the left here, Scotland will remain in the lead? Or perhaps the second option, will Scotland develop uh, but kind of level off and start to look more similar to the UK wide trends? Or do you think that maybe um, this third option, uh, most of the growth has already been um, sort of developed in the Scottish license area and we're now going to start seeing that UK level trend sort of surpassing the historic Scottish growth rates. So I'll give you a few more seconds there to think about that question. So looking great, we've got about 22 people responding so far. So I'll give it a little bit more time, give everybody a chance to let their voices be heard. Excellent, that seems to be slowing down now. So if that's all right with everybody, I'm going to move on to our next question on onshore winds. So this question is about smaller scale projects. So those that are likely to be connecting to the distribution network. Um, will, will Scotland start to see more small wind projects connecting to that distribution network? Um, so do you, do you see that growth being on the smaller distribution scale, or do you see actually more of the onshore wind in Scotland's future being larger scale and transmission connected projects of multi megawatt capacity? I'll give that one a few more seconds as well. We've got a good amount of engagement so far, but a few people left to, to respond. Great, thank you very much for engaging with me on wind. So we've got one more technology. Uh, we're going to be moving on to large scale solar PV now. 
in the north of Scotland. I've got a couple of questions here uh, based on the future of de deployment in the sector in the north of Scotland. And I've got another question relating to the sort of geographical spread of our projections and what factors are important in determining where geospatially, where on the map that pull, uh, solar uh, that those solar projects should be coming on board. So here is a map of the current baseline sites. Um, so you can see it looks quite small. We've got about 36 megawatts of capacity from six sites that are above one megawatt of capacity. So those slightly larger scale projects, uh, unlikely to be um, domestic projects there. And we've got about 55 megawatts as well from 351 much smaller scale sites that we have sight of from the connections data of under one megawatt of capacity. Um, and this, this number is likely to be a little bit larger because this is not including any sort of uh, FIT feed-in tariff scheme sites in the area. And now we see quite an extensive, you can see this map for the pipeline projects is quite different from what we're looking at for the baseline sites. Um, it's still limited compared to the southern SSCN license area, but you do see a lot of interest from solar developers in this area. Uh, what you're seeing visually represents around 384 megawatts from 19 potential sites of above one megawatt in capacity, uh, which are the sites that I've mapped here. And on top of this, we have about 262 megawatts from around 20 sites that have been issued a quote. Um, as for smaller scale of less than one megawatt, there are about uh, 43 megawatts from 242 sites with a connection agreement as well and 11 megawatts from 54 sites of less than one megawatt have been offered a quote. So again, that's that split between the above one megawatt and the below one megawatt capacity. So there is an extensive pipeline to think about. And here's a snapshot of our projections for the large scale solar. So up again, above one megawatt here from our 2020 analysis. Um, here we see um, in our most ambitious scenario, reaching 922 megawatts by 2050. That's our leading the way scenario. And um, in our steady progression scenario, so the, the lesser sort of range of those predictions shows about 280 megawatts connecting by 2050. So now I'm gonna move on to our first solar question and that's about the development of solar. So how do you see solar PV deployment developing in the future in the north of Scotland. Do you think that there's going to be a significant decrease, increase in the 2020s, so in the near term? Or do you think that, well, maybe the solar capacity will be delayed a little bit, but we'll have more capacity connecting maybe in the 2030s and the 2040s? Or perhaps you see that uh, solar is just going to continue to be a pretty limited technology in the license area. And instead, we're going to see more development in other renewable energy technologies to meet that net zero by 2050 target. Great, we've got quite a few responses so far. About 20 people have joined in, so I'll give it another few seconds until I move on to our next slide. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Those look like really good responses. Looks like it's pretty much across the board here, but we've got some preference for more development, in the 2030s and 2040s. That's a really interesting result to see there. Thank you so much for your engagement. So now I wanted to take a step back and talk about the distribution factors. So um, I just want to explain where our solar is likely coming from within the license area. Uh, Regen performs an in-house solar resource assessment. So like the onshore wind resource assess assessment, this helps us to determine where solar is likely to be built out in the long run. Um, the resource assessment includes a variety of factors such as solar irradiance levels. You can see a map of this on the right. Not much happening in those northern areas of Scotland where you have those lower values of solar irradiance, um, which can explain the limited baseline up until now. Um, we also look at whether or not the land is on an existing biosphere, on an area of outstanding national beauty, uh, if there are any sort of geographical limi limitations in this way, 
and we incorporate several other factors as well. Uh, we also look at relative planning friendliness. So we look at, um, in this particular planning regime location, have projects historically been able to go through? Have they, they been rejected? And we, are, we welcome any kind of information that anybody has on the call today on particular um, planning environments and whether or not that is likely to change in the near term um, based on any sort of inside knowledge people might have that's very valuable intel to us. Uh, finally, we look at things like locally declared climate emergencies at a local authority or regional level and climate targets, renewable energy targets to determine what the ambition levels are. And that can also help us decide where that resource is likely to come through. So I have a question on this and I want you to take your time thinking about what I've just spoken about in terms of those distribution factors. Which ones are the most important to you uh, in terms of determining where that solar is likely to be located? Um, so again, is it going to be that solar irradiation level? So whether or not there's a lot of sun coming down in that area or not, or do you think it's not actually a big factor uh, in terms like our, our solar technologies can handle lower radiation levels, perhaps you might think this, uh, perhaps um, whether or not there's capacity in the grid locally in that distribution network, existing capacity could be a big factor. Maybe planning friendliness is a big factor for you. Uh, perhaps uh, a bigger factor might be whether or not the local authority has solar deployment targets, if they're pushing for solar in one area or not, and um, whether or not you think a local authority has declared a climate emergency might also be an important factor for you. So take your time. And um, I know this one can take a little bit more time than a multiple choice question. So think about it and arrange your answers accordingly. Really interesting to see that grid capacity seems to be coming out on top here. Um, that could change. We still have some answers coming through. Solar irradiation seems to be coming in on the second. So another really important factor, just what is the natural resource available and how can we utilize that? So far, I don't see a lot of votes for climate emergency declarations, which is also very interesting to look at. Great. Well, I think we've got enough engagement on this question, so I'm going to move on to my final technology, which is hydropower. Um, first of all, I know this is a lot, so thank you so much for being engaged. Um, we really appreciate all of your engagement on these questions. It really helps us sense check uh, what we're doing and make sure that we're pushing our analysis in the right direction and continually improving. So thank you so much. All right, so with hydropower, I've got a couple of questions again on the historic growth of the sector. We know that it's a legacy technology, but there is a pipeline and some growth. And I also wanted to touch upon the impacts of climate change for hydropower and how that could be affecting the sector. So here again, we've got another couple of maps. Um, again, I said it's a legacy technology, but there is a pipeline of projects um, and it would be useful to get some inputs for this year's analysis. I don't think we asked anything about this last year, so it would be great to kind of freshen up our model and make sure it's going in the right way. Uh, so we have about 815 megawatts of baseline hydropower capacity from about 452 sites. And of these sites, um, all of them that were above 10 megawatts in capacity, so those slightly larger scale sites, were built before 2002. So what we're seeing is on that distribution level, we're seeing a lot of smaller capacity, small hydropower sites being built in more recent years. Around 90 megawatts are in the pipeline with 41 projects currently seeking a connection offer. However, about 40 megawatts of that 90 megawatt figure is due to, is only about 40 megawatts of this are due to new build plants and about 50 megawatts of that is for a pre-existing plant in Lokeber that is securing a future capacity um, to the network. So it doesn't represent added capacity, only around 40 megawatts of that pipeline represents potential future added capacity. Here is a snapshot of our projections from the 2020 analysis. As you can see, it's relatively limited in terms of variation between those scenarios. So we're not projecting a massive growth in the sector. 
And this is in line with what the national level says future energy scenarios for all of um, Great Britain are projecting. Um, so we really follow those trends for this model. But um, so this is likely also due to uh, micro hydropower growth in the future. So many of those smaller scale sites coming on board rather than an increase in larger scale sites. So following along that trend. So with that in mind, I'd like to jump into my first question on hydropower. Um, which direction would you see the small hydropower sector headed in the north of Scotland license area? Do you see uh, more of a limited growth, assuming that nearly all of the economically feasible sites have been used up? So that would be the first option. Do you see some steady growth in the smaller sites, perhaps the run of river uh, under one megawatt generally, but something to run a house or just the smaller schemes? Or do you see more growth in the medium-sized sites? So that third option of over one megawatt, um, moving towards this sort of medium uh, level uh, uptake, or do you see perhaps a big growth in both small and medium-sized sites? Looks like we've got about 18 people responding so far, getting closer to 20. Try to get that up to about 25 before I move on. So I'll give it another 10 seconds to let everybody get a chance to fill this one in. Great, thank you very much. And I've got one more contextual slide uh, before I move on to my last question and we can move on to some other technologies. So I just wanted to talk about um, how climate change might affect the sector. Um, historically, the annual average rainfall in the last decade, so from 2010 to 2019 was 9% wetter. So 9% more rainfall happening than the 1961 to 1990 average. So in the earlier decades uh, leading up to this past decade, we had 9% less pre precipitation than what we're seeing in the past 10 years. Um, in general, Scotland is expecting warmer, wetter winters with more intense rainfall events by 2050. Under a low emissions scenario of about one degree of warming by 2050, we see this being 8% wetter. And by 2080, under a higher emissions scenario of about 2.7 degrees warming by 2080, we see that being almost 19% wetter in those winter months. In contrast, the summers will be hotter and drier with greater extremes and will be 7% drier with about one degree of warming and about 18% drier with three degrees of warming. So in sum, this is going to mean heavier seasonal rainfall in winter months, but drier summer months with less rainfall. So keeping this in mind, here's my last question. Um, now that you know how precipitation has been changing, how do you think it's likely to change the future of the sector, especially thinking about that small hydropower sector? Do you think the sector is going to be affected positively? In other words, will this increase the rainfall in winter months and therefore be a net benefit for the sector and increase the electricity output of these plants? Uh, or do you think it will be negative uh, with increased seasonality of rainfall, perhaps being detrimental to the sector. Um, do you think that this maybe is not going to have much of an impact on the sector and that this variation is, is not really going to change very much? Or perhaps you think it's going to be a mixed effect. So that last option, um, perhaps you think there are going to be some net benefits and some, some net negatives and it's all going to sort of even out. Great. Seems like uh, most people think that it's going to be a mixed bag and we're going to see both the positive and the negative effects. So very diplomatic answer there. Thank you everyone for engaging. Um, I think that's everything for me and my technologies. So over to Ray on energy flexibility. Thanks Tamsin. Great stuff. Um, nice to spend some time uh, thinking about renewable energy technologies in the north of Scotland, especially the hydro questions uh, were, were really interested to hear some views around that. 
uh, for the license area particularly. So I want to, uh, the last suite of technologies before we get a chance to, to answer some of your questions, many thanks for all of them uh, diving in on the Q&A. We will get to those. Uh, don't forget to upvote um, any that you would like us to definitely try and cover in the session. Um, yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about flexibility technology. So I want to talk about electricity storage connection to the distribution network, fossil fuel generation, and hydrogen electrolyzers. So if we start off with storage, so it's a, a technology that we added a, a few years ago. Now um, we've kind of disaggregated the types of storage asset or the types of storage project that could be connecting uh, because it's not just a one size fits all uh, generic storage project. So we've we've considered business models for storage, which I'll cover. Um, and we also want to um, ask some views about other electricity storage technologies, even though battery storage is, is dominating the pipelines that we're seeing. Uh, we also like to talk about other technologies out to 2050. So as I, as I mentioned, we categorize storage into a number of different ways. So we call them business models or asset classes, um, and, we, and we use four. Uh, so we project essentially four different types of storage project. Uh, one is standalone network services. So standalone multiple megawatt scale projects that are providing um, services, balancing services, response and reserve services to the electricity system, either contracted with, with uh, the uh, system operator uh, or providing broader market-based um, services uh, and contracted um, um, solutions to, to the network. Um, so the kind of shipping crate in a field type, type model um, that you're seeing battery storage projects at the minute um, deploying. Generation co-location, um, as it says on the tin, essentially, so batteries or other storage technologies that are co-located alongside uh, renewable energy, traditionally te technologies, although we have seen a handful of fossil fuel co-location as well. Uh, but for the modeling, we consider predominantly um, wind and solar co-location potentially hydro in the north of Scotland as well. And these are similarly sort of megawatt scale uh, projects um, that are either electrically connected to cooperate with those generation technologies, or they are sited alongside them geographically, but they have their own route to the network, potentially sharing a, a substation, if you like. Um, so co-location is, is a key um, separate um, deployment that we're seeing. Uh, high energy user, so co-locating storage behind the meter, usually on site uh, at large energy user uh, premises. So warehouses, factories, uh, water treatment works, um, yeah, and anything along that, that may make use of the storage for on site energy management or possibly short term um, UPS or an uninterruptible power services type um, potentially uh, uses. And then the last one is domestic storage. So um, basically home batteries. So the domestic market for using storage, either alongside rooftop PV, or again, potentially providing short term backup services in perhaps more remote locations that are more susceptible to, to trips and, and brownouts and blackouts. So we, we categorize these uh, for uh, business class, business models for storage. If we look at the, the license area to date, uh, a fairly limited uptake of uh, storage that are connecting to the distribution network. So we have site of five battery projects, a lot of them on the, on the uh, Egg Muck and Rum Islands there, as you can see on the map, um, total capacity of, of 1.1 megawatts. Um, so not a lot connected to date, but if we look at the known pipeline that we are seeing um, significant um, a number of projects of 46 projects totaling around 1.6 gigawatts, uh, which is, is a huge amount potentially waiting in the wings. These are sites that have accepted connection offers. Um, and we're also uh, looking at how many of them have planning approval. Quite a, num a large number of them have planning approval or are active in the UK capacity market. Um, and there are a mixture of business models and scale. So we have sort of 50 megawatt standalone sites as well as some domestics and, uh, and sort of hundreds of kilowatt scale batteries that are connecting on site um, and industrial user type uh, sites. So a really interesting view. So not much to date, but a massive potential pipeline. So a question we have um, is of those models for the license area that we're, we're, we're looking at for North of Scotland, the, the renewable energy deployment that Tamsin has stepped through 
um, the potential of electrification, some domestic properties that Joel has stepped through and also transport. What do you see as, as of, of those models? Do you think we'll see most connecting to capacity by, by 2050 um, in the license area? So it is, is it going, going to see many more of those standalone um, storage projects providing services to the network uh, with some of the Pathfinder, um, stability Pathfinder um, services at National Grid are looking specifically for Scotland. Um, could that be where a lot of the um, capacity goes? Is it going to be co-locating with that significant pipeline of and um, baseline of wind or the, the, the connection of solar or potentially diversifying to, to co-locate with legacy hydro plants? So is co-location going to win out? Um, is it going to be that large energy users in the north of Scotland actually see the value of storage and start to deploy uh, a, a lot of um, potential projects and sites? Or are we going to see a massive uptick and a consumer transformation, if you like, um, and see the domestic sector start to deploy home batteries left, right and centre? Are we going to see people buying home battery systems from B&Q and start to uh, get them commissioned in their house, in their garage? So I see it's a bit of a, a two horse race at the minute, a mixture of standalone and co-location. Um, I'm lesser so for the other business models. Again, as I said earlier, uh, you don't have to be a storage expert to have a view on this. Um, anything that you, you guys are seeing or, or have a view on, we, we'd really appreciate. Um, so we're sort of slowing down at about 20 responses. So we'll probably leave that one there. Um, so Stan alone has just tipped, tipped over the top there. So thanks very much for your views. So as I said, um, in the um, baseline and pipeline, the predominant technology or dominant technology is standalone solid state batteries, mostly lithium ion, if not almost entirely lithium ion based technologies. Um, but obviously we do consider and accept and acknowledge in the four scenarios that we are looking at that other technologies have and will potentially come to the fore economically. Um, and we could see deployment of non-battery storage solutions across the country, as well as in the North of Scotland specifically. These include uh, ones that we're aware of, um, liquid air um, storage, uh, pumped hydro, obviously a strong technology in Scotland, um, but on the distribution network, not so much because they tend to be large scale transmission connected, um, but small scale pumped hydro could be something that we see modularization, uh, economies of scale or economies of technology, potentially um, bringing that down to distribution network level. Uh, flow state batteries, um, so vanadium redox, for example, zinc bromide, um, those kind of non-solid state um, storage technologies or um, other ones such as flywheels, for example, could connect to the distribution network. So a question we have, um, what te uh, technologies other than solid state batteries do you think we could see operating in the north of Scotland license area by 2050? So it's a long time. Technology can evolve a lot. We appreciate that. The answer could just be yes. Uh, to all four of these, but we'd really appreciate views on which one do you think may have a suitable environment um, and technology and you know role to play in the north of Scotland specifically. Um, we're obviously engaging with the storage sector. Um, Regen actually uh, manage the electricity storage network, um, the UK's in industry for electricity storage, and a number of our members are obviously at the heart of uh, looking at, at storage deployment and, and technology evolution. So we, will, we are and will be, be engaging with them. And obviously developers that are active in, in the license area with battery projects, we'll be approaching some of them as well um, to ask about whether they're planning to diversify um, their technology deployment later down the line. So um, this is really to supplement that engagement because we'd love to hear from you guys as well. So pumped hydro, small scale pumped hydro seems to be um, one that's coming out on top, and that's a, a really interesting and relevant thing for the, uh, for the license area and also touches on the hydropower conversation that um, Tamsin led a moment ago in terms of climate change and rainfall, et cetera. Um, so that's really useful. Um, we'll leave that one there. Many thanks indeed. So I want to talk about fossil fuels generation. So we've got this one and then hydrogen electrolyzers, and, and then we're, we're finished. So thanks very much for your continued uh, input. We really appreciate it. Um, so essentially diesel and gas. So the, the scope of the analysis at the, for the DFES for diesel generation, 
Um, we look at standalone commercial diesel power sites and we look up, uh, basically assess and, and include backup generators that can also export to the network. So we're aware, we totally understand there are other backup diesel gensets across um, the license area that basically can only cut in when the mains goes down. So true backup only. Uh, but for the purposes and the scope of the analysis, we only consider generators that can also export. For fossil gas or methane fuel generation, we look at a number of different types. So gas turbines, open and closed cycle, um, reciprocating engines, and gas-fueled um, combined heat and power or CHP installations, which tend to be a bit smaller scale. Um, and there are a number of policy considerations with these being fossil fuel technologies. Not only um, UK and Scotland specific net zero targets, um, EU directive, the uh, medium combustion plant directive, um, which has essentially provided a really stringent um, barrier to new diesel likely being connected that are not uh, for backup services only. Um, and obviously the declaration around a fully decarbonized electricity system by 2035 puts a real spotlight uh, on existing and near-term potential fossil fuel generation that doesn't have any abatement technology. So there are some precedents here. Um, we're aware I'm going to feed that and build that into the scenario projections, but we would really appreciate some thoughts on this um, for anyone who has a, has a view. A bit of a snapshot about fossil fuel generation in the license area. Um, there are a number of diesel engines on the islands um, so a number of the islands have backup diesel um, to support the electricity supply to those communities um, alongside the subsea cables that they have, or if they don't have a subsea cable, um, they are there as well to, to support electricity supply. That totals around 126 megawatts. We do see a small pipeline of four additional projects. These are mostly new backups for maybe hospitals or university campuses, for example. And that totals around 34 megawatts. Looking at gas, uh, we have 18 sites, around 50 megawatts. Almost all of those are small-scale on-site gas CHPs. Again, in, uh, in, in sites that, that use the heat locally, so hospitals and, and universities, for example. Um, and we do have eight new projects, almost all gas peaking plants, as we call them, or gas reciprocating engine sites, commercial, um, just under 100 megawatts. Um, and 56 megawatts of that have actually secured planning approval or are positively active in the UK capacity market. So with that in mind, um, if, we, if we start with diesel, um, so we re recognize and um, have been talking with SSCN about uh, the Scottish islands. We actually have a separate workshop this afternoon um, with a number of representatives from the Scottish islands to talk about them specifically. Um, but a key technology at the moment is obviously the diesel generation that supports those island communities. What do you see taking on the role of diesel engines as essentially a technology that is at, at odds with um, fossil fuel generation, et cetera? Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, with, with um, at odds with net zero targets that, that fossil fuels are. Do you think it's going to be a shift to bioenergy? So biomass or, or biomethane, for example, on the islands. Is dura um, battery storage technologies going to increase um, its, their durations and, and discharge time? So is, is batteries going to sort of step in and take on the role of diesel. Is it exhaust abatement technology actually gonna sort of swoop in and, and see diesel continuing to, to play a role? Um, hydrogen fuel cells are another potential technology solution that could take on the role, or is it actually none of these and something else that we've missed or that we're unaware of that could take on that backup and sustainable um, supply of electricity role? Um, and we'd obviously really appreciate any thoughts for the three who have We've currently said that, dive into the chat and do, do let us know what technology potential that could be. So we're heading around 20, which is probably um, where we've been across all of the questions. And it looks like long duration batteries and potentially a bit of bioenergy could, could be taking on those. And we fully recognize that uh, the islands are different um, and that may actually be a different solution depending on the islands and the resources and the, the potential to, to connect the, the different technologies and what is already there in terms of generation. So we, we understand this is not one answer fits all 
for uh, for all of the islands. Um, but yeah, obviously we'd we'd really appreciate any, any other thoughts. Okay, we'll move on. Um, what about fossil gas? So methane fired generation. What do we think may happen in the north of Scotland out to 2050? Um, so is it going to be gas price um, as we've seen recently and net zero obligations and targets and pressure will actually hit, have a hard stop and prevent many new sites connecting beyond 2025? Um, do we think there's going to be a, a short term surge of interest to connect gas uh, generation sites and then maybe a steady decline from 2030 beyond to the 2045 target for Scotland? Uh, do we think that we will see continued deployment out to 2035 or essentially until it is not permitted to operate legally? Do we see that it will continue to, to see some sites connect to, connecting? Or actually, do we think that the existing sites will simply sh shift their fuel if it's provided to them? So hydrogen supply is obviously uh, an interesting potential in some areas of, of, of North Scotland with the existing gas networks or hydrogen conversion zones that may, they may be coming in the longer term. So will those gas peaking plants potentially become hydrogen peaking plants in the 2030s and 40s if the economics and business models for those types of sites actually stack up? So we see a bit of a, 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 switch, a shift here between essentially gas generation stopping fairly quickly or actually a long-term view that, that those gas sites will become hydrogen fueled sites in, in the longer term. So uh, many thanks for your views, that's really helpful. So the last section that we've got before we can uh, hear some questions from you guys is around low carbon hydrogen. So as I mentioned about hydrogen peaking, hydrogen is a really interesting um, new fuel sector essentially in terms of low carbon hydrogen. Um, so I wanna talk a bit, a bit about that sector and, and some Scottish government um, conversations and ambitions around that. We want um, to sort of understand and, and hear about use cases for hydrogen and where do we think that will be prioritised in the north of Scotland and some specific points on, uh, on green hydrogen production, so hydrogen electrolysis. So as I said, a bit of background, um, low carbon hydrogen could play a role in decarbonisation. Um, it's essentially a new fuel sector so for the production of low carbon hydrogen, transportation and use. Um, it's still nationally unclear how those strategies will play out, how we will make it, how we will store it, how we will get it to where it's needed and to be consumed. Um, so that regionally that's unclear and also nationally that's unclear, but we, we, you know, we're starting to see some, some clarity on that with some of the consultations that have come out around the hydrogen strategy this year. Electrolytic hydrogen, or sometimes known as green hydrogen from electrolysis, could be a significant source of electricity demand on SSEN's network. So distributed electrolyzers could start appearing in some, some areas where demand is needed. Um, and the Scottish government's hydrogen policy statement that came out towards the end of last year sort of states a high ambition for hydrogen in Scotland, as you can see in that excerpt on screen. Um, and there are multiple potential end users for low carbon hydrogen in the future. Um, this includes transport industry, um, et cetera. And this is a map of some of the uh, hydrogen innovation projects that are seen across um, Scotland and the north of Scotland specifically, um, and different types of projects, whether it's production uh, or end use, et cetera. And we can also see some of that appearing on the Scottish islands as well. Um, so, yeah, as I said, there are a number of potential uses. Um, so transport applications, not just road transport, but also rail, potentially even aviation or, or marine and shipping, for example. Um, power generation, we talked about space heating, potentially hydrogen boilers is a technology that features in, in one, of the, uh, one of the scenarios significantly. Um, and obviously decarbonizing the existing manufacturing of hydrogen. Um, is also a potential use case. So of those uses, um, for, the, for the north of Scotland specifically, with the, the ambition set out by Scottish Government and also some of the innovation projects that we are seeing um, in the area, in the north of Scotland area, how would you rank those potential uses um, for the area? Um, do you think that it's going to be focused on large road vehicles, so HGVs and buses, for example, 
is actually shipping and ferries a really uh, strong potential use for hydrogen in, in the license area out to the islands, et cetera. Um, rail network in Scotland, there's obviously a strong case for electrification there, but is there going to be potential um, for hydrogen rail networks for some parts of it? Industrial processes in the area, could we see high temperature processes or thermal driven processes that, that are diff more difficult to electrify? Um, potentially, could we see hydrogen taking a role on there? Um, or heating homes and businesses, is that actually going to become um, a priority um, for hydrogen where there is gas network coverage? Um, and as I said in the last question sections, will we see a significant uptake of, uh, of hydrogen fueled electricity generation? So this is the last but one question. So if you want to share your views with us, then you've got two questions to go. I appreciate we've asked a lot of you today and we really do appreciate everything from everyone. Um, I think we're starting to, to slow up the, the views. I realize this is a bit of a ranking question, um, but we'll give it five more seconds. Uh, it looks like transport is, is the, the likely um, focus area for low carbon hydrogen, which makes a lot of sense in terms of the communities that we're seeing as well. Last question, guys. Um, so this is a very specific one. So as I said, hydrogen electrolyzer projects, which could be multiple megawatts individually, could be located anywhere where there is local demand. Um, do you think the north of Scotland could become a significant proponent of hydrogen electrolysis deployment by 2050? Could we see a lot of electrolysis connecting to SSEN's network uh, across the region? Um, so it's an out of five kind of ranking from yes, it's going to be a really strong potential to actually know other parts of the country is probably going to see a lot more uptake proportionally than, than the north of Scotland. Um, so it's getting a strong indication here that uh, yeah, it's a strong opportunity for Scotland with all of the different mixes of generation and, and, uh, and end use cases that we touched on. Um, so that will definitely be something that we feature into our electrolysis projections, which is essentially, we've only been doing that for about a year and a half. So it's a relatively new technology for us. Um, so yeah, it's something that we are constantly thinking about at the minute in terms of how it might play out um, for, the, for the North and the South license areas that we are studying. So we've heard from 20 people. I think we'll leave that there. Thanks ever so much to everybody who's, who's waded through and plowed through all of those voting questions. I can't tell you how valuable and useful that intel is for us. Um, it will probably influence some of the direct modeling the cells in the spreadsheets that we will be doing in the team, myself, Joel and Tamsin. Um, so thanks again for all of your effort and input. So I think now um, we've got about half an hour um, left. Um, so we're going to have a bit of a question panel session, um, which is going to be myself, and I'm going to be joined back with my colleagues, Joel and Tamsin. Um, and I'd also like to introduce um, Ewan Norrington, who is the lead account manager in the Connections team at SSEN with a bit of a focus on the North of Scotland license area. Um, so can I ask Ewan, um, welcome and many thanks for being with us um, today to join the Q&A. Um, can I just ask you to introduce yourself and um, you know, we'll get going on some questions. Yeah, um, thanks Ray. I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Yep, absolutely. And um, yeah, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, Ewan Norrington, I'm the lead account manager for the connections business for the Shep D license area. <clears throat> and many of you will be familiar with either myself or, or the team of account managers, which um, we operate to support your, your connections. Uh, we've been working closely with, with Ray and the team in Tamsin uh, with regards to a lot of the data that's been presented today to, to get um, an accurate picture of, of where we think things are going. So happy to be involved and, and take on any questions or take away any questions that we're unable to answer. Great. Thanks, Ewan. Um, so thanks to everybody who's been diving in into the Q&A. We've got quite a few, so we'll see if we can get through as many as we can. Um, so let's start off um, with one. So anyone who wants to upvote any that you see in the Q&A box, please feel free. Um, Tamsin, I'd like to come to you first, if that's all right. Um, Leslie Jane Powell has asked about Tidal and Wave. 
Um, what about marine technologies? Um, is that in scope for the DFIS? Thank you for that question. Um, the, the only reason we haven't spoken about it today is in interest of time and trying to get through all these different scenarios. But yes, uh, we do speak about marine uh, tidal and wave technologies separately, and we treat that in the model. I, I will go ahead and say that we do like at the uh, pipeline of existing projects, and we put a lot of weight on our projections on those existing projects that have been in the pipeline for a while. Uh, we know that this technology is relatively young and still faces a lot of barriers. So we have quite a range within our projections as well. So in terms of a steady progression, um, we see not much being built out beyond current levels. Um, unfortunately, in this scenario, it does have to be quite pessimistic, uh, but we do also reflect a very optimistic view, especially in our leading the way scenario towards the later part of the projection period, really seeing this technology become, becoming um, feasible and taking off. But again, most of our analysis is based on that existing, um, existing project pipeline. And you can find out more in our methodology uh, workbook, which I believe I posted a link to in the chat. So feel free to peruse this and ask any further questions if you, if you have on that technology, any more specific ones that you might have. Thanks, Tamsin. Yep, it's definitely a technology that we have uh, looked at individually, and obviously we're aware that it's a strong potential in the license area. So thanks very much. Uh, obviously, you can also look at projections from last year for that technology as well from the report we produced. Um, so Johnny, uh, my colleague Johnny Gowdy, um, who is a director here at Regen, um, has there's been some discussion in the in the chat around uh, network charging, so um, pay payments as part of both your bill, but also in terms of connection costs to connect and make use of the network, essentially. Um, there are some different um, divisions of that. So transmission network user system or Tenuos and distribution network user system or Duos. Um, there are some reforms ongoing around those charges to connect and make use of the system, something under the umbrella of the significant code review and the charging review. Um, and obviously the technologies that are connecting pay to make use of the network and those reforms may affect the business case for those technologies. So um, Johnny, is it all right if I sort of bring you into the conversation and maybe share a few thoughts and then we can touch on maybe some of the individual technology uh, implications uh, from myself and Joel and Ewan? Johnny, are you with us? We can't hear you right now. We'll give it a, another couple of seconds, just in case you're, you're you're scrabbling to find your mute button, or you've uh, or you've made, maybe you've got Teams open as well that's taking your microphone, for example. We can't hear you, so no problem at all. We'll um, we'll move on from that. Um, but yeah, essentially, uh, Ewan, uh, feel free to to dive in here. But basically, we are considering how some generation projects that basically uh, the the connection charges are becoming shallower. So the, the costs that the, the developers, uh, so that could be EV charger deployments on the demand side or renewable energy and storage technology on the generation side. Um, some of those, those boundaries are becoming shallower. So is it as simple to say um, that, you know, the costs are going to be less or is that, is it a bit more complicated than that from what you're seeing? I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, Ray. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're very much in a sort of watching brief at the moment with regards to sort of account management connections team. Um, I know that our transmission business have um, released a consultation, which um, some uh, of the participants here today will, will have been um, party to in terms of a response. And there's um, further sessions planned on that in the coming uh, weeks and months with Scottish Government, Bays, Scottish Renewables. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. Certainly at the moment with regards to the applications that we're seeing uh, coming into the business, um, there is, um, whether hesitancy is the right word to use, maybe for the want of a better word just now, um, is that when you're looking at those larger capacities, um, there's certainly a, a bit of doubt um, being um, expressed by the developers with regards to what decision they're ultimately going to make at the moment. And I think some of the comments that I read from um, the, the chat earlier were that they really need to kind of um, move forward with this decision 
uh, and to give us some clarity, uh, not only as, as a DSO, but um, as developers as well, so that we can progress this. Thanks, Ian. I guess in terms of some specifics, uh, uh, Joel, are we, we're considering how um, that could affect things like EV charger uptake in the, in the near term. Uh, do you want to touch on a little bit about how, we've, how we're thinking about that? Yeah, it's just a very quick point, which is that um, we consider that there's a, a potential, the potential of a risk of um, developers uh, 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 delaying some of their um, connections um, by a year, um, uh, resulting in a, a brief year long, perhaps uh, slowdown in, in installation rates and then an acceleration to catch up um, uh, where they would have been without those network changes. Thanks, Joel. Um, so I guess being that, it, that some of it is a minor two decision at the minute, we are not applying it across the board in all four scenarios, for example, but we're considering a scenario specific approach to some of these reforms and how they might affect generation and storage technologies. But the report that we publish uh, working with you and the team um, towards the end of the year will include some input and insights about how we have treated and how we have considered those reforms in the modeling. So uh, watch this space um, as we uh, continue and every, any other input from anyone who wants to share some views on it, please do, please do get in touch and we'd love to have a, a further conversation. Uh, Donald Fu, um, there's a question here um, about electricity storage. So how will electricity storage be viewed on the, on the future network? At the moment, it's difficult to secure connections and the required capacity as it is, is still being modeled and viewed as normal conventional generation which is not and can which it isn't essentially and it can't be very flexible to help resolve network constraint issues uh, a fair point i mean as you'll see uh, hopefully from the um, slides that we step through we look at storage in a number of different business models and different sizes and classes and scales um, so we don't just see storage connecting as one thing um, we see it in different technologies and different scales and, and, and business models um, so I guess one thing is engagement with those developers that have got accepted connection offers, um, you know, asking them what their deployment timeline is looking like, what they're planning to do, um, if they've got planning as well as a connected offer and they're active in the capacity market, that's a fairly good indication that they're hoping to connect in the near term. Um, but in terms of them being treated as generation uh, for the purposes of, of uh, charging and uh, other things such as planning, for example, that's an absolutely live topic and something that we're at the ESN, Electricity Storage Network, we're really engaged in. There's a bit of different schools of thought, I guess, that some see benefits in being treated as generation and some see benefits in storage being classified as its own asset class. The conversation continues around that. It probably isn't a definitive position. Um, and obviously we, are, we have four scenarios uh, essentially to model and play with and, and, the, and the future outcomes for that hopefully reflect different environments in terms of connection planning um, and the value that is seen of storage as a technology class. Um, basically, you know, we're hopefully we can reflect, will all that pipeline go ahead? Will all of it and more go ahead? Will only some of it go ahead? Um, and obviously when um, is essentially featured in our scenario. So that and other impacts on storage as a technology are all factored and featured into the four scenario worlds that we model within. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, so uh, Joel, I've got a question here from Alistair Wilcox about electric vehicles. So how does vehicle purchase behavior differ between the north of Scotland and, uh, and the wider um, GB? If there are fewer new cars sold as a proportion of all cars, then will this not influence, i.e. delay, EV uptake ubiquity between regions? Um, and that the same question applies within the north of Scotland itself as well. Yeah, um, I think that's a really good example of um, why um, there are regional differences between the uptake of EVs. Um, historically, a couple of the key drivers, or perhaps three of the key drivers in the uptake of EVs has been um, uh, affluence, um, has been rurality or urbanicity of an area, and the number of um, company cars in an area. And obviously, ma many of those factors are wrapped up into how many uh, brand new cars that might be considered in the region. We are seeing those historic trends breaking, though, at the moment. Um, certainly, how rural an area is has very little relation on the number of EVs, um, with the exception of London. Um, but once you're outside London, um, there's 
that that link is breaking. Um, uh, company cars and affluence is still there, but is 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 less. It's not a strong uh, a factor at the moment. So um, yeah, I think that's a good example of why um, the uptake of EVs isn't yet um, ubiquitous. Um, uh, yes. Thanks, Joel. Um, you and I'd like to come back to you if that's all right. Um, so there's a question from Piers Blackster here. Um, so Steve's presentation right at the, towards the start of the session highlighted Spellthorn and some of the substations that, that are going to go red over time with EV uptake and, ex, and, uh, and heat pump uptake, for example. Um, with all those red substations, what are the implications for the supply of new kit? I'm guessing that that is in the, the sense of supply and deployment of new network infrastructure, uh, et cetera. Yeah, um, I, I was just um, getting ready to, to put a, a link into the chat here, actually, for everybody to have a look at. So we've got our, our SSEN um, EV strategy, which was published um, March, April time last year. Um, so the, there's, there's plenty of useful information in there. Um, I have to admit that I'm not as close to the EV um, side of things as, as Steve is, but my, my understanding is, is that as, as a DSO, we're, we're looking at various sources uh, and um, technologies and solutions to to monitor um, at a substation level the um, the uptake, so that we can monitor that in real time, pull that into our control rooms, and manage it from there. It's um, somewhat of a complex um, scenario to overcome, not knowing exactly what the picture is going to look like in the years to come. But the strategy itself sort of outlines our approach to that. So I'll, I'll hit enter in a moment and put that into the chat. And for anyone that, that would like to know more information, there's uh, plenty of it in there along with the um, specific sort of EV contacts within the business, that, which we'll be able to provide you greater clarity on it than I can. Apologies, great. I can't provide you more. No, that's that's great, Ewan. Thanks. If, if you have to, to, to share that, that would be brilliant. Um, Tamsin, I'd like to bring you in on this question as well. Um, so Stefano, Gambro has asked um, a question actually to SSCN, but I think we can we can share some thoughts. So with regards to our modeling, uh, Regen's modeling of future scenarios on the network, has SSCN instructed us to only evolve the existing network or have they essentially commissioned a blank sheet of paper uh, when we calculate the, the network topology to meet, meet future demand, for example? Can you just give a feel for, for how we approach it for like, for example, generation technologies uh, or, or other technologies in terms of the broad approach? Absolutely. That's a really pivotal question as well for how we do the analysis. And I think it's important to step back and think what is the purpose of the distribution of future energy scenarios here? <laughs> the real purpose is to look at how we can stress test the existing network. So we do really look at where the network is um, as it stands here in order to understand where the, um, again, I don't know if you remember uh, Steve giving this outline of the distribution future energy scenarios, and then we've got the constraints map, and then we've got the infrastructure plan. So it really is an analysis that feeds into where the distribution network needs to be investing in the current network to make sure that it takes on board this new expected capacity growth. So we are really looking at where the existing network is, but um, the goal here is to expand that network in the long run and to see where that needs to be going. I hope that answers the question. Let me know if I've missed anything, Ray. No, thanks. Thanks, Tamsin. I think, um, yeah, you summed it up nicely there that we do pin our initial view around where the network cables are. And obviously that is going to be where we are focusing our projections on. But we essentially divide the geography into those ESAs. Um, and if there are, um, there's, there's limited network capacity, but there is strong potential for future wind or solar, or, or there are lots of um, areas of, of uh, potential EV charger uptake, for example, we do factor that in, in terms of there could be significant there. And an interesting example, um, some of the uh, islands, I think this was uh, uh, near Stornoway on one of the islands, um, we were made aware of a non-domestic development um, that could be significant demand for that substation, so sort of above and beyond any historic uh, demand growth that we've seen because of the scale of it. I believe it was actually a, a spaceport, um, for example. So we do consider disruptive future sources of demand that could unpick or completely need a, a significant transformative change of the network infrastructure 
in that area, if there is good reason for us to flag it through to SSCN through the DFES projections, then that's that's essentially what we do. We don't we don't say, well, there's not much network there at the minute, so that's unlikely. We will say, well, this is a known development, and here's where it is. Um, and uh, you know, if your network um, needs to react to that, that's essentially part of why we do the DFES, as, as Tamsin said. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Piers. Um, uh, Joel, I'd like to come to you around heat. Um, so actually, it's another question from Piers as well. Um, has the difficulty of retrofitting heat pumps into old plumbing be considered as a societal factor that mitigates against their retrofit? So how do we consider old older properties? Yeah, um, so a couple of ways. Um, at a macro level, um, uh, it's scenario based, of course. There's an electrif electrified scenario and a hydrogen scenario. So um, uh, implicitly in a hydrogen scenario, um, it's assumed that uh, you know that th there's there are fewer heat pumps um, as it's perceived that hydrogen might be uh, easier on the consumer, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, at a micro level, um, there we have a number of different distribution factors um, that evaluates the uh, uh, likelihood of heat pumps um, being installed um, locally, um, and one of those factors. Um, uh, is the is the type of property um and we we're not you know we uh, in our projections we we're, we're not at the level that we um uh, we're not saying that you know a particular house um uh you know 14 privet drive will install a heat pump on a particular date because of x y and z um uh looking at a number of factors um to look at um you know uh, over the whole network how how feeders might change so um uh, so yeah, we, we are considering those micro factors to evaluate, uh, evaluate the relative likelihood of heat pumps being uh, uh, taken up in particular areas. And one of those is the type of property, the relative suit suitability of a property for having a heat pump. Thanks, Joel. Um, you and I'd like to come back to you. I think we'll, we'll take a, a few more questions. Um, so um, does SSEN as a DSO believe that it is better for the nation for the nation for consumers to have choice of electricity supplier at EV charging points. Um, presently, the EV charger operator determines who supplies the electricity and its cost, but the regulation decouples hardware from supply and allows domestic clients to choose their own supplier. So any views in terms of SSCN's um, DSO side of thing? I know this is potentially more a question for Steve and his role, um, but yeah, any, any thoughts from yourself around um, you know, <coughs> separating the hardware and the supply side of thing? Yeah, I, I, initially I would like to get Steve's thoughts on it, so I, I will take that away and, and ask him to expand upon on, on what my own thoughts are. Um, but certainly at the moment, um, we would, um, or certainly the, the conversations that we've been having uh, suggest that the development of technology is similar to what they use in other countries around the world, is that you would be looking to develop a, a payment system which is linked to your sort of domestic account and you can pay by debit card and if they're linked to the same sort of bank account then you would get your preferential rates or whatever rate it was that you had agreed um, I think that's certainly what the uh, elements of the states are using um, and, and, and perhaps some places in Europe also um, but in, in terms of um, the, the actual SSEN view on that I'm sorry I can't um, confirm uh, if, if there's a a specific angle that we want to take on that no problem you and i think i think as i said there's some questions that we're going to leave open for, for for us to sort of respond to in a bit more detail so um that will probably be one of them that we uh, take away but thank, thanks for your initial thoughts there um so joel there's one here around lcts generally um joe has asked us would you say that lct forecasts are more economics driven or policy driven so he's given an example of the total cost of, cost of ownership of an EV. Is that more significant driver than such as the ICE vehicle ban in our, in our analysis? Or is it scenario specific, for example? Yeah, I think I think two sides to this is one is, is scenario specific. Um, there are scenarios in which the uptake of, of uh, particular low carbon technologies is slower. And I think implicitly there'll be a number of reasons behind that. Which are both of those factors a combination of, but I think also um, these scenarios are predominantly uh, often policy based. Um, 
the uh, in particular with EVs, um, two of the net zero scenarios, uh, oh, sorry, the net zero scenarios have very similar um, economic assumptions. Um, for example, they assume the same fuel costs. Um, uh, and I think the key variable for EVs is the the, the date uh, for the ban on petrol and diesel vehicles, obviously. Uh, sets a fairly fixed point uh, uh, policy position as to um, how the uptake of, of EVs could, could change up to that point. So I think in the case of EVs, it's predominantly policy-based. I think in the case of heat, it's predominantly policy-based, um, requiring you know, some fairly national decisions on the direction um, of uh, our future energy infrastructure. Um, but it, it is a combination and it does vary by scenario. Thanks, John. I think last uh, one, there's a couple of questions from Stefano um, around how the how the FES and I guess the DFES as well um, directed at us um, treat both economic economics and also regulatory um, status quo. So I think I sort of bundle those two together and we will take them as a way and, and I provide a broader answer. But a, a summary view is that essentially because we have four scenarios and this can also lead, lead to the question around hydrogen, um, there are some broad future horizon scanning views around what those worlds are and how you know, things change. Uh, so the system versus consumer transformation have very different views of achieving that zero and therefore the impacting the technologies that, that will see uh, support, see uh, uh, direct policy support, maybe through subsidization or, or, or enabling funds or broader support in terms of consumers going for them and adopting them and buying them and purchasing them over others. So I think a broad answer is that we don't just take the current framework in terms of regulation or the common economic structures or technological costs. We do not just take that and see how that might play out. We basically spend time in the four scenario worlds that, we, that have been defined by National Grid in terms of broad definitions of them. And then we see how that could affect uh, the individual technology take up. Um, so it, it doesn't assume that the existing regulatory structure will continue and it doesn't assume that the economic growth or, or cost reduction trends uh, flatline or stay exactly the same. It's very much dependent on the scenario that you are in, which is why they vary much more out to 2050 than they do in terms of known projects that may connect in the next five years, for example. Um, the, the answer, the more detailed answer is obviously within the report. So if you can open up the, the projections from last year, which we can send you a link to in the chat, um, the, the report will show you how we have essentially um, treated the, the potential uptake of EVs, as well as biomass and renewable energy technologies that Tamsin explored. And you will see variants across the four scenarios. And there are reasons for those variants that we have, the assumptions that we have made in the short term, medium term and long term are essentially itemized and detailed. Um, as to how we've arrived at those, those projections. Hopefully that gives an in initial answer, um, but we will, as I say, some of the questions we will take away, I'll work with, uh, with Ewan and Steve and, and the guys and the team and see if we can, we can provide a bit more of a detailed response. So I think we'll leave it there. Um, so thanks very much um, for your time. We do have a session this afternoon with the island communities to spend a bit more time looking at those islands and some of the bespoke considerations for those. But many thanks for everybody's input, polling, sticking with us, all the questions. It's been great. It's been a fascinating session. Really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, it probably leaves me to say thanks to my team, to Tamsin and Joel, and to Ewan and to Steve uh, for contributing to today. Um, and we will be in touch soon with follow-up documents and uh, some answers to the other questions. And uh, do get in touch with us if there's anything else you'd like to share. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your days and uh, all the best.